Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to Life in the Peloton. I'm Mitch Stocker, and the Tour de France is upon us. We're halfway through the Tour de France, and it has been a very, very exciting race so far. And actually, I've got to experience it firsthand. I've been over here in Europe in France, in Denmark, to watch the Tour de France, to report on the Tour de France. I've gone back with my old colleagues, Lionel Burney and Francois Tomazo to record daily episodes on the cycling podcast. And it's been a really great experience, not only as a journalism, but just to hang around the Tour de France. The Tour de France is this big beast. Inside the race, of course, we know that. But outside the race, the people that come to it, the sponsors, just the atmosphere around it. It's just been... It's been pretty incredible. And along the way, I thought, you know, well, I might record some of this. I might try and give you guys a little taste of what it's like to be on the tour. Some of you may have been to the Tour de France before, and some of you may be thinking, oh, I would like to go to it. Well, what I've tried to do is set up what it is. I've talked to riders, I've talked to fans, I've talked to directors, sportives, mechanics, as many different people as I can to try and paint this picture for you of what the Tour de France is, this race that we all know about. As well as being on the Tour de France, I also got to experience firsthand the Palace Rafa collaboration kit. What did you guys think? I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Of course, we were well aware of the collaboration a few years ago when that kit hit the world by storm and now they went back and did it again. Last time was at the Giro. This time they released it at the Tour de France and I grabbed Magnus Court Nielsen, the KOM wearer, the polka dot jersey wearer for the first week and I asked him, what is his favorite piece of Rafa clothing? I think my favorite piece is, is the black shorts so that's uh that's a conservative part of that kit and uh i think black shorts is just always holds up well and uh yeah we we'll, we have some colors on, on the sponsors to to match up with uh, with the jerseys and and the bike and uh I, f- I think that that's really beautiful well the black nicks can you believe it magnus i thought he would have gone for something else but you know some people are traditionalists and that's the thing that Rafa do well too. We know that. They do the bright, crazy stuff, which is more my style of things, but they can also tone it down and do some really, really classy looking kit. Well, Rafa is the proud supporter of Life in the Peloton this year. I'm really enjoying working with them and I'm so happy to have them on board. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. This is On the Road at the Tour de France. Well, the road less traveled, actually, that is something that we've been working on too here at Life in the Peloton with Swa Cycling. Go across and check that out if you haven't already. That is a limited edition Tour de France tribute t-shirt that we've done, which is the map of the Tour de France, the road less traveled, and all the features that are on this year's Tour de France route. And I'm talking about wineries, breweries, rock concerts, whatever it is, check that out. That was designed by Rachel Peck and we got together with our old friend Tom at Swa Cycling and produced an awesome t-shirt for you guys too. Guys, check that out at swascycling.com, C-O-I-S cycling.com. And now guys, sit back, get ready to experience the Tour de France. Well, we're here at the start of the Tour de France, and yes, I'm behind the scenes. That's why I want to take you a little bit behind the scenes of the tour, because this thing is a beast. And as you can hear, I'm in the buses, I'm walking through all the buses, I've got my yellow lanyard on, my Tour de France lanyard that gets you sort of the keys to the city, gets you in and out of different places. So I can get in here, I'm talking to a few people. What I want to do is just take you a little bit behind the scenes, what it's like on the Tour de France, I guess behind the barriers and um, so we're here day one in Copenhagen, Denmark to kick this thing off. I'm speaking with an old friend of mine, Gregory Russ, now a director sportif on Trek Segafredo, actually a director for quite a many years now. Greg, mate, how are you buddy? I'm uh, still good. Yeah. yeah. We're down at the Tour de France. Can you tell me what you've ridden six Tour de France's? Now you've been directing a few. I don't know how many. I'm feeling the atmosphere here. What is it like 
tell me about this beast. You know, you were on the first day, you're feeling the, the energy of the race. What do you love about the Tour de France? What do you hate about the Tour de France? Oh, it's actually my first Tour de France as a director. Is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, I did three Vueltas and one Chiro, so oh. it's also a premiere for me here. But uh, I, uh, I always, especially when you start uh, in a place like Copenhagen, uh, the atmosphere is unbelievable good. When we saw the team presentation, all the riders was really, really uh, a little bit emotional even for Mats, it's mm. so special and they couldn't believe it and uh, I think on the road today we saw already a lot of people okay right now it's a bit raining and the people are hiding a bit but uh, the riders will feel I think the atmosphere really tomorrow on the road stage mm. and after tomorrow here in Denmark I think it will be super amazing. Do you remember back to your for first Tour de France that first stage and that feeling you had what was that feeling like? Oh, yeah, I have a couple of memories about the Tour, good one and bad ones, of course, like every other riders who did Tour de France, so for sure we did some Tours 2009 and we won with Alberto and I remember more the end than the beginning because we, uh, we uh, enter first on the Champs-Élysées with mm. the team and this is, I still uh, get goosebumps mm. when I think on this, this was one of the best moments of the career. What do you think, and you can tell me because you've seen the riders, how are they feeling they just want to start, I can imagine, and a late start today, four o'clock. What's the feeling of the riders? Is the nervous energy? Is it good? Is it what is it? Yeah, I mean they are all a bit uh, bored uh, because they are all here since Tuesday, and now we have uh, Friday, so it's quite a long time with training. And then you go team presentation and the uh, medical checks and the uh, 25 uh, PCR tests. So they are really, they really want to go now. Now it's a bit quiet in the bus because it started mm. raining, uh, but uh, yeah, it's like it is. It's only 13 k's, and we have Mats here and uh, the others. They don't need to take the biggest risk, so I think they all want to start. What about the uh, bar scene? You've been out having a few beers, checking it out because I've been out checking it out. It's a cool city, Copenhagen. Have you been out to have a look around? <laughs> Uh, these days are uh, <laughs> at the moment over <laughs> it was very very good possible in the past i think but we are uh, about 50 k's outside of copenhagen and with the covid rules internal rules it's not the good moment to go in a bar with uh, people not wearing a mask <laughs> and i think we saw in tour de suisse what happened uh, but how fast it still goes around and we really try hard to avoid this so uh, no bar uh, no bars at the moment Here this afternoon and share this ever so important moment in Tour de France history as we turn to a story indeed. You know, if you like a story of the, the rider who wins from the breakaway, you would have loved the story of this rider back on the Tour de France in 2014. Alongside breakaway artist Martin Elmiger, he was there at a stage that went all the way uh, to the end in Nîmes. He got caught with meters to go. This is Jack Bauer! The nation of New Zealand represented here. Jack Bauer, for bike exchange, Jaco setting off on his first pedal strokes now, leaving the official ramp in the Danish capital. I'm here with a good old mate of mine, Simon Geschka. The tour has begun. This is your 10th Tour de France, and now we're finally underway, mate. What does it feel like to get this thing underway? You're literally sitting here on your time trial bike, in your kit. How was it? Yeah, I'm happy if I switch to my normal bike again tomorrow, because it's not, it's not my favorite machine, the time trial bike, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty great to start the 10th tour already. Um, not that nervous anymore than uh, at my first. But still, yeah, every, every time you do the tour, it's, it's special. And uh, yeah, this morning I was nervous again. So uh, even, and I think uh, when you stop being nervous before the tour, you might as well end your career also. <laughs> so I think it's a good thing. What were the crowds like? Because last year when I was hanging around, it was a little bit of a different feel, the end yeah. of the COVID period. It looked like it was back to what I imagine normal. It was huge out there. Was it like that? Yeah, for sure. So the team presentation two years ago, uh, two days ago uh, was really, really uh, a huge crowd. And today, I mean, it's, it's raining, but still uh, there were a lot of people. It was the whole time uh, constant noise during the TT. So that was definitely nice. Is this year going to be your last tour? You reckon you can squeeze a few more out? You never know. Every tour could be the last one, so yeah, try to enjoy it. Next year, I don't know. I have a contract for next year, but uh, I might as well end up doing the Giro. You never know, so uh, yeah, I enjoy it as if it would be my last. I'm standing here with Matt Heyman. Mate, 
the eve of the tour. It's not quite Christmas, it's not quite Roubaix, but it's I guess it's Easter, isn't it? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's nothing compares to the eve of Roubaix, but um, no, this is a big one. I mean, now that I've got a bit more experience, been around this race for a little while, but uh, we've got Nick Schultz here. It's his first Tour de France, and uh, I remember what it was like. Uh, mine was in 14, and we started there in Yorkshire. So, yeah, it's, it's big vibes. Everybody's back, and more so than ever when you come to a place like this, Copenhagen, and, and you just know that the fans are going to be amazing. You know, they're just that, they, they don't get this every time. They're going to make an effort to, to get here, and, um, yeah, it's always exciting. It is exciting. It's really got a really good vibe. I've never ridden the Tour, but... Being on the other side of the fence, I get the feeling like now how cool it really is. And I, I sort of think, oh, it'd be awesome to do this prologue today. I'm not talking about the mountains. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but the prologue today would be awesome. It's got a cool vibe, doesn't it? Yeah, until it started raining. And then uh, I was just in the back of the bus with Durbo and I was like, what do I say now? It's pissing down rain. He's been looking out to do this prologue for a while. And uh, there's about 19 billion corners. The two, it does. It, like like the big classics, there's just that something in the air, and you can't really define it. Um, it's not it's not Dauphiné. When you get here, there's a few extra staff members. The crowds are bigger. The presentation that they did the other night would have set set the scene for them. So, but in the same token, we've been hanging around the hotel for three days. Guys just want to get this on the road. They want to get kicked off. They want to get this stage and 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 probably halfway into tomorrow's stage, and then they'll feel like they're in the tour. It's a bit of a release valve, isn't it? What about for you personally? Do you actually like driving in the car at the Tour? Oh, look, I guess as a rider too, you want to be doing the best races and the biggest races, and, and it's nice to be here. Um, there's more pressure um, and pretty full on with the crowds, and, and but you feel the stress with the other directors. Everybody knows that, that it's on the line, and you've you got to be ready to go, and you've got to be making the right moves just like as a rider. So. Let's talk about, lastly, the most important thing about this year's Tour de France. Stage 5. <laughs> let's talk about it what are you thinking well i just went i went to pick up the stuff at the accreditation and uh, i was talking to one of the ex-pros there and he was handing out the stickers and i'm going yeah but what about this and what about that and he goes mate there's more than one stage in this tour de france stop asking me questions about stage five yeah but are you going to move the grass on sector three and um so yeah look i'm excited and i'm excited to go there with this team because you know last time i was here was with adam yates as a rider riding the roubaix stage and there's a lot of pressure on, you know, having to have one eye out for him, trying to get into the final, and we were really trying to nurse him through that stage, and I knew I wasn't going to, you know, be able to ride for the win. Uh, we don't have that this year, no GC rider here. A couple of guys who have had a bit of experience on the cobbles who, who like it, um, and, you know, Jack, Durbo, Matthews, they're all guys that can handle themselves on the cobble. We've got nothing to lose, so the guys can go in there pretty relaxed, as relaxed as you can be going into a Roubaix stage, but we don't have to be looking over our shoulders or waiting for anybody, so it's going to be good. the morning of the second stage alexander you're from sweden you're on the other side of the barriers you're a fan you've traveled across to see the tour is that right yeah that's right that's right uh saw the stage yesterday with my family and now we're here as well today just catch the start before we go back to stockholm how unique is it that you just had the tour de france just around the corner really across the bridge were you getting pretty excited when they announced the start over here? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course I was. Uh, it's, it gives us a great opportunity to go go over here and, and see the start without having to travel all the way to France. Uh, so it's just, it's wonderful. It's been a beautiful start of the race. Uh, it's been so bad. The crowd's been so big. Uh, it's been, an, an, uh, the atmosphere has been just fantastic. Have you been to the tour before now? Uh, yeah, I saw the tour in like 2001, 2002. I was standing on uh, the top of Col d'Espan. Uh, with my with my mom and, and her boyfriend. Uh, so I have some old photos of Ulrich and, and Armstrong in, mm. in the middle of the peloton in the some drawer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> explain to people listening, because this is for life in the peloton, explain to people listening out there what they're missing. What is this atmosphere I'm talking about? What is the feeling here? You know, because it's really difficult to understand that when you're watching it on the TV. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard to, to, to get that when you're watching. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a big party, uh, especially with a stage like yesterday in Copenhagen. It was just such a, just a super long party. Uh, we, we walked about two kilometers of the, of the course. It was just, you know, full of people, even though it's raining, it was just, you know, everyone was happy. It was some drinking, drinking some beers, you know, lots of music and just everyone sharing. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was beautiful. 
Durbo. Welcome, mate. You're going to be frequent this this uh, episode because I'm going to catch you all week. We're here at the Tour de France. I'm behind the fence. I've got the, the yellow y- lanyard on so I can go essentially where you can. Mate, what's it like? What are you feeling? We're, the real day is starting today, isn't it? Oh, man, it's been incredible in Denmark. Um, you know, I think the biggest crowds we had, I ever had at the Tour de France was in Yorkshire. Um, and apparently today they reckon it's going to nearly rival that. Really? So, yeah, it's going to be insane. So there's apparently 400,000 people out yesterday and only 13K. It's just been a really, really cool atmosphere. Um, you know, through the streets of Copenhagen last night, the presentation in Tivoli Gardens. It's the big show. Um, but, yeah, we're ready to go. We're, we've got a big big opportunity now with Dylan uh, today. And so we're got all in for that and uh yeah just gonna enjoy the day are you feeling nervous was this eighth tour for you is it yeah i'm um, yeah i'm obviously nervous for sure i think that's normal if you weren't nervous it's uh you don't do your job properly so yeah i'm, I'm nervous but i'm also excited you know well we're gonna catch up with you all week so mate we'll leave you at that it's about 30 minutes before the start what is one thing we're gonna see from you today mate what's one thing you want to see from today's stage um for me personally i'd like to be the put the boys onto the bridge in good position and then uh, set up our sprint train. So depends on when that can happen. That can cap- happen 120k to go with this uh, with the Tour de France. So hopefully I can uh, I can do that. All right, Nick. Just before you jump back in the bus, we're at stage three now already. Schultze, uh, you're practically half a Frenchman anyway. Um, your first tour. How exciting is this, mate? Yeah, it's next level. Everything's taken to a whole nother level. You know, I'd heard all the stories before coming here. Um, But that's one of the reasons I wanted to be on the start line here to experience it for myself and uh, Yeah, it's it's unbelievable Uh, The the crowds are are next level. You can't see where you're going. You can't hear anything You can't practically can't see anything and it's just stretched from start to finish But I mean, it's the big show and uh, it's what I want to be a part of and it's awesome Tell me about what you were telling me before because I just said why don't you just go sit at the back? You know don't get in the fight, but actually it's still not easy at the back of the peloton is it? No, exactly. And I think uh, that's also a difference between other races. Like uh, with about 50k to go yesterday, I checked out essentially. And, and, you know, I had no more work to do. uh, And I went to the back and I thought I'd have an easy ride until the bridge. And it was just uh, the people who are at the back actually don't want to be there because there's so much stress in the bunch. It's just this constant fight that people are still fighting at the back. And then there's these pinch points that slows down you lock up there's a crash left there's a crash right and actually you're just doing like extra accelerations that you don't need to be doing and um that's something that i think is very different to other races and uh yeah you know it's just it takes its toll and it's already taken its toll on day two what about before because this is something i don't think anyone understands to get to the tour de france you essentially have had this massive build up mental stress physical you're in the best form of your life even a few weeks beforehand just to get selected then suddenly you start this what you just told me the most stressful hardest race so tell me about that preparation to just get in the tour team yeah i mean so much work went into it it was also a really rocky start to the year um but i just had to sort of have faith in the process and and keep chipping away um but i must say the the last couple of weeks where it was sort of in limbo i thought i might be coming but i hadn't had the official call it was really nerve-wracking and uh you know, like there was one morning I was getting ready to go for a ride and I banged my knee on the on the countertop and I was stressing and it's like, I just wanted to wrap myself in cotton, cotton wool, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, big nerves coming in and, and also like once getting that call um, sort of amplified everything because particularly with the health crisis, it's like, well, now I need to get to the start line. Um, and we had to pass two PCRs before the race and there was just a whole other element, you know, and... Uh, but yeah, I guess that also all adds to it because I've not felt that for any other race before, including other Grand Tours. All right, Neil Stevens, my old director, good friend of mine. Steve-O, what's it like being on the tour, just in general? You've done some tours as a rider, but now you're as a well, long-time director as well. Now being back up in the atmosphere, what's the vibe like of the tour? Second day now, is the steam coming off a little bit? Is it a bit more relaxed today after yesterday? Uh, yeah, I suppose that the, uh, the with any major tour, the, when once they get the first kilometre of the first road stage, is a, a whole different story. Basically, from there on, it just uh, it just keeps on rolling along, and uh, one day after another. Up until now, the the presentations and that stuff, like I'm really not into it at all. Mm. Uh, it's just all too much razzmatazz for me. And even the day yesterday, the time trial, it's stress, it's uh, and it's an individual race, and it's a, the race really hasn't started as such. For me, uh, once the race is up and going, 
and then uh, basically goes one it goes on from there after that. But um, in all reality, you know, my major thing in my uh, my mind is to, to disassociate myself from the tour, to think this is just another race and try to get on with it that sort of way because otherwise. So much razzmatazz, uh, basically, it'll uh, get, on, get on top of you, really. Maddie, mate, we're in the second stage in your home country. Has it simmered down? Tell me about the vibe. What is it like having the tour? Because you've ridden the Tour de France before, many times, actually. What's it like having the tour in your own country? Super weird. Yeah? Super strange. Yeah, yeah, like having the bus just outside that the park yesterday. I, I slept in the park uh, when I was younger. After a big night out, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was thinking about that night when we were standing there, like yeah, yeah, that's biggest the event in the, like in the world basically, uh, especially on Danish soil, and having all the spectators here, you know, people I know, um, that that was special. It sucked with the weather though, but I mean, what do you expect? It's Denmark. It was strange, like because I was seeing that too. It sort of transforms the city. And you almost don't re- recognize your own city because of all the buses, the barriers and everything like that. Yeah, totally. But I, I must say, I was kind of in the zone yesterday. So, you know, even though there were so many Danish flags and spectators all over the course, my wife was standing there waving. I didn't see anything. I was just in the zone, su- super concentrated. So it was, a, it was a tough day and it could have been anywhere, basically. Once we started with the first rider, um, with, with Bisiga there, I mean, it could, we could have been in France, basically. Watching the caravan come through here, the people are going wild. The Danish flags, are, I never thought they'd get into it this much. Well, who knows? It's the Tour de France, isn't it? This is just crazy to see firsthand. This caravan, I can tell you, is ridiculous. I'm talking with a great old mate of mine, Simon Clark, from Zero to Hero, at the end of last year, <laughs> He was in a bit of trouble, his team folded, looking like he was gonna to have to join me on the other side of the fence, but he's like, nah, I'm not done. Gets a last minute contract with Israel and they are so happy they signed him. You're here at the Tour de France, mate. Yeah, look, uh, looking back, it's, it's, a, it's a great story and you know, you don't think about that when you're in the middle of it, but yeah, it's, it's just, you know, they always tell you never to give up, uh, but it's true. You should take it literally and just never give up because if you don't, uh, anything's possible. And, uh, I, I continued all winter, Australian summer, preparing like I was ready for turning, going back to racing, even though I didn't have a team. And when Israel rang, I, I was ready to go. Listen to that crowd. What is it like? You've been to, I, I don't know, eight, nine Tour de France. I don't know, you're going to tell me in a second. <laughs> but how is this crowd here? It's got to be one of the best you've been in. Yeah, look, uh, this is my seventh Tour de France and uh, the crowd's amazing. Uh, Unfortunately, with COVID the last couple of years, the guys who haven't done a pre-COVID Tour de France uh, can't compare because this is finally, we're back to pre-COVID Tour de France crowds. So, I mean, this is the Tour de France I know and it's crazy. And unfortunately, the last couple of years, it hasn't been able to be like this for various reasons. And it's great to see that we, we're seeing the old Tour de France back. Zach Dempster, now he's he's a big wig. <laughs> he's gone up, he's gone, moved to Israel. He's a DS, now he's one of the, the DS of the Tour de France. Demers, what's it like? What's this big beast like? Yeah, it's uh, busy. I think, like, as a rider, you feel the, the Tour is pretty crazy, but when you see all the behind the scenes of what's going on, you know, there's, there's a fair few plates spinning, put it that way. Um, so, yeah, it's important to be prepared, and, and when you get here, you know, you know it's going to be chaos, so you you kind of mentally prepared for that. And as long as you've done your homework before, then then it's okay. What about the riders? How have you kept them sort of cool, calm, collected? There's a few newbies here. Um, you having done the tour before as a rider as well, you know what it's like. What are you sort of doing to try and calm these guys down? Well, half of these guys are older than me anyway, so yeah. uh, they've done a fair few more tours than me. But I guess from from this side of the fence, you know, as long as like I mentioned before. As long as the, the planning's tight and the strategy communication wise of that, you know, is clear then then that's yeah, you create like an environment of calm I guess. Um, so yeah, let's see. We're day one now, we've only had the T T. Um, so there's plenty of chaos coming and you know we just go day by day. Did you guys do you let them all go out for a bit of a walk around the city yesterday and get the vibe of the crowd? Yeah, yeah, of course they did a cafe tour beforehand in the rain. <laughs> No. Pretty, it's pretty strict, like, 
for to give everyone an idea of what it's like over here, you know, COVID is very much in place here. It's like I feel like I've gone back two years. It's masks, it's bubbles, isn't it? Yeah, like it was strange, you know, like the spring it was kind of like, all right, COVID's done. And then you kind of felt it creeping up. Um, but then Swiss, man, Swiss was like back to Paris 2020, you know, it was all right, a third of the peloton's gone home, masks are back on. You got to be super careful. Guys are staying away from their families coming out of Swiss for the tour. You know, we had Daryl and P uh, go home, stay somewhere else, away from his family, and in the end, he ended up picking it up. But he picked it up in Swiss, and it finally came out in the incubation period a few days before the race. Which it's shit. Like, there's no other way to to describe it. You know, the guys come from a wheelchair last year, wheeling around his basement to the pool after the hip. You know, the hip breaking his hip. So then all of a sudden, yeah, just getting his carpet, the, the rug really just ripped out from underneath him after winning a stage in Swiss, you know, which was a huge thing. Honestly, coming in, it was kind of tough to deal with that, but we're here now, stay focused, um, and let's see if we can, you know, get out of this race what we came to do. Well, I've run into Michael Rasmussen walking down here between the buses. Michael, what's it like having the Tour in your home country? What's the feeling? Are you jealous? Are you enjoying it? Obviously, I, I wished it happened in my time as a rider because uh, the reception of old riders has just been absolutely amazing. And um, before the tour came, there was lots of talks about how how much money the country actually spent on this event. But I think you know all that uh, criticism has to be silenced now after the the reception and having you know one and a half million people on the streets uh, in Copenhagen because this is something that will. It'll go down in history and people will be, they'll be talking about these experiences uh, in 10 years from now, I think. Well, you were a man who loved wearing the polka dot jersey and I especially loved it when you went full polka dots. Like, I mean, bike, nicks, helmet, everything. I'm, I'm a man of the aesthetics. Magnus Court today, he could get the polka dot jersey. What do you think? How good would that be, a Dane wearing polka dot in Denmark? I think, you know, maybe a couple of the Danes, they should actually go for that because, uh, well, just being on the podium in Denmark, that would be, that could be something maybe even career changing for them um, in, in that sense. Um, so yeah, you know, they should just throw everything at it um, because these, li these little hills, uh, they are, they're not really mountains here, right? You know, it's, a, it's an area where I grew up and, uh, and Magnus, he won on one of those, uh, those climbs. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, he won the stage in Tour of Denmark uh, some 10 years ago. Um, so he knows that area very well. How long is the climb? Well, it's about a kilometer. Uh, so you know, basically it's just a highway bridge, but uh, nevertheless, you know, he's, he's got a good punch and uh, he can do it. So life on the other side, it's stage two, and I'm actually now walking down the finish straight. Can you believe it? That's the best thing about having this, this yellow pass here. You get to all access pass. And um, the atmosphere is pretty incredible. Pretty incredible, there's people everywhere. So, I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of that feel and see if I can find someone along here at the finish line who's probably been waiting here for hours. We are literally two meters from the finish line here in stage two. Guys, who am I speaking to? My name is Lugge. And Rasmus. And how did you guys get two meters from the finish line here? Uh, my dad got up at like three in the morning and took a train out and uh, stood here at 4.30 this morning. So he's, we, he's been standing here quite a while and the rest of the family, we joined him a, little, a, bit, a bit later. Unbelievable. And are you guys from, where, how far away from here are you? Uh, we're from Aarhus. 100 kilometers. Yeah. Are you looking forward to the finish? Who, who do you want to see win today? Uh, of course, Mas P. Matt Pedersen. What about Magnus Court Nielsen? Yeah. Okay, it's fine. Yeah. But Mesh P is uh, our favorite right now. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, guys, I hope you enjoy it. Two meters from the line. You guys are going to see the real winner. Yeah. It's going to be great. We go. Can you yeah. tell me, what was, mate, been out on the bike today? What was it like out on the bike? Bradley Wiggins, that is, in case anyone doesn't know. Yeah, it was amazing, actually. The crowds were incredible. Um, it reminded me of London, actually, a few years ago, well, 15 years ago now, when we started. But um, very nervous. Straight away from the start, you could see everyone was uh, pretty twitchy. Obviously, with this bridge in the running, and everyone's preempting that today. I think. How'd it feel just being out on the bike, wind in your hair, and that sort of feel? Yeah, it was good. 
it was nice actually I'd done the Giro so that wasn't too long ago but it's always nice to be at the Tour you still even on the motorbike you get a sense of what it's like to be at the Tour yeah yeah <laughs> That is the crowd for Magnus Court Nielsen, polka dot jersey, day two of the Tour de France. How is that reception? Unreal. Talking with Raj, he's a mechanic on my old team, EF, Easy Post. Raj, what's a day in the life of a mechanic at the Tour de France? You've done now, this is stage two. Is it stressful? Yesterday was a stressful day for you guys, you know, crashes, people everywhere. Do you like this stress? Honestly, we don't like, as a mechanic, we don't like this kind of stress. We hope the riders come in safely at the finish, you know. But yesterday we have a very bad day, which is uh, Rigo's bike was broken, Ruben had a crash, the fork is broken, so we have a little bit long day yesterday. So, instead of finish by early dinner, you do have nice, but we finish late, a little bit late. So, it's a routine of to the front. What is it like having to come in after seeing the car all day, and then suddenly you've got to repair these bikes? It's it's taxing, isn't it? It's a pain in the ass, actually. Nobody, <laughs> nobody like it, actually. But we always cross the finger, nothing bad happened in the race, you know. But this is cycling. You cannot change it. I'm here with Chris Hamilton. Mate, tell me, the tour, this is your first tour. Yeah. Stressful, holy shit. Everyone says, like, yeah, the tour is different and it's a lot more stress and stuff like that. But then, like, when you're actually thrown in it, it's, like, from as soon as the break went yesterday, it's, like everyone's just like just fighting for a spot you know it's like you're in the last 40k of a normal stage race or whatever like the whole day yeah but i guess now it's pretty early days so it's still a little unsettled there's still no like pecking order you know but it's just like i try i went back to to get bottles with like 70k to go and man it took me like half an hour to get to the front of the guys because people just don't move like (laughs) Yeah, it's not like they're riding in a team or anything like that. It's just like, oh, you know, oh, you want to come through the bottles and I get f- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you just got to remember those guys, you know. You're just like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to remember you for next time. Mental note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, oh, I don't know. I think probably it'll settle down in the next week or so, but who knows. <laughs> well, today's supposed to be a bit of crosswind, isn't it? Like, I don't think it will be, but everyone's prepared for it, you know, so that's just... And, yeah, I guess, as you know, the crosswinds aren't the worst, but it's the stress before it and stuff like that, so probably be a bit on edge again today, and, I don't know, I'll just... For me, I've just kind of got to stay near the front and take wind for the... to keep them out of trouble, which I don't mind doing, because when you're back in the bunch and the shit, it's pretty grim. All right, boys, now we're here at the finish line of the Tour de France. Why have you come down? What do you What do you want to see today? Well, we just want to see the uh, the cyclists and uh, just have some fun over here and, uh, you know, with, with some friends and, yeah. Are these your mates here? You guys don't follow cycling normally? No, not normally, no. We don't. Uh, not that much. Uh, but because uh, it's in our uh, hometown, so we think it's to, to, to show some support. Uh, for the cyclists and uh, for the city so we, we decided to come down here and have some fun what's been the feeling of for the whole of um denmark you reckon the first three days of the tour de france going through your country well it's pretty extraordinary uh, we, uh, we we can't really uh, yeah. understand that it's actually here uh, we've always you know every summer just looked at it you know we know what tour de france is but uh, we just look at it in the in the tv and but now that it's here and, and we, we see, you know, Denmark uh, in the TV and things like that, some places we know. So it's, it's pretty, pretty awesome to see that we, we, we feel a bit more important. Okay, after a pretty hectic start in Denmark, and from what I understand, not normal for the Tour de France. Everyone's saying like, you know, they haven't seen that since 
Yorkshire days or London days, you know, so, or even Belgium, they said. But now we're back in France. It is a bit quieter, but there are still a lot of people here. I'm back at the buses, seeing, I'm going to have a chat to the guys or to the riders and see what they're feeling now they're back in France. The Tour de France is now in France and what the vibe's like. We're now at stage four, I guess. Tomorrow is Roubaix. All right, guys, fans of the pod, but more, more importantly, fans of the tour, who am I speaking with here? Yeah, Andy. Dan. Ollie. Adam. And where are you guys from? From the UK. Where? Yeah, Felixstowe. Oh, right, Felixstowe, yeah. All right, well, tell me, guys, how have you got here? Why have you come here? What's the journey be to stage four? We're here in Dunkirk, the start of the race. What's been the journey to come and see the tour? Uh, our journey was easy, jump in a car, get in a tunnel, just arrive. And it, when it's this close to your house, you've got to come say hi to the Tour de France. And what are you excited about coming here and seeing? Or so far, what you've, like, what's the vibe like? You're like, oh my God, this is so cool. Or, oh, uh, you know what, it's a bit underwhelming. Oh, it's super cool. It's relaxed. It's like loads of good people talking to everybody, just chilling out and seeing the, the riders, which is awesome. And see them racing later on. That'll be mega. Who have you seen that has been pretty cool to see? Like big stars. Well, I mean, G rolled past us with his gilet off today, so that's pretty exciting. <laughs> Fingers crossed something good will happen there. And what are you going to do later on today? What's your plan to watch the race? Going to pick up the car, try and pick the race up a couple of times, get some beers. It'll be, it'll be good. Find some sunshine. It'll be lovely. It's well and truly bureau clock already. It's well after 12. What are you doing? <laughs> we'll, we'll get there soon. We'll find them. There's yeah. a cooler in the car. They're, they're on ice already. They're ready to go. They're on ice? Oh, yeah. What did you bring over? What have I got? I've got a couple of vedettes and some brew dogs, I think, chilling in the van, so this should be uh, pretty good. All right, Brett Lancaster, DS of In Your Screen and Years, buddy. Mate, Roubaix is upon us. Who cares about the other stages? What, what are you thinking about tomorrow's stage? How are you guys going to sort of change your, the way you DS in comparison to a normal stage? Well, the way we DS, you know, it's a lot more in it, as you know, Mitch. Um, I think it's the way we approach it. Um, as, as the way we group, you know, you're going to have, I think, you know, in the other stage up to now, you know, have eight guys, we keep a bubble, but I think we're going to have to have, a, like, say, a Dylan Van Baal with a, with a Yates, you know, really just put pairs together because, you know, you're not going to keep a team of eight together, are you? It's just impossible. So I think we're going to approach it that way. Um, you know, up until the first sector, you can still have the traditional, you know, bubble at the front as we ride. And then after that, we'll, we'll probably team guys up, you know. I think Luke will be with Adam, sorry. Dylan with G or, yeah, you know, um, something like this. We still have to talk about it, but um, we'll sort it out. I'm here with Dylan Van Baal, the winner of Perry roubaix mate. This is a <laughs> bit of an honour to talk to you, buddy. Where's the rock? Was it good getting it home? What's the fallout been of Roubaix? Yeah, um, it's it's home in uh, in Monaco. Um, luckily, I drove by car to to Belgium uh, for the <laughs> classic, so I could bring it home. Uh, but yeah, it, it's such a nice experience, you know. Uh, every day I got a reminder of it. Still, people coming to me, sending messages on on social media. Um, yeah, that's pretty special. I spoke to Matt Heyman after he won Roubaix, and he said he couldn't watch it for a while because he just kept getting too emotional. What about you? Have you really watched the race? Yeah, to be honest, I watched it uh, like maybe two weeks ago. Um, I couldn't sleep and then I was like, yeah, maybe that, that gets me in sleep, but no uh, no chance. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't get really emotional from it, but um, I just get a nice feeling of it, uh, watching like images or photos. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's just something really special. Owen Duel, mate. First time I've seen you actually since I stepped off. I've been watching you on TV. You've really looked like you've actually turned a page. I don't think you were going um, badly or anything, but you've just sort of been injected with this new energy, it feels like, new position in the bunch. How does it feel being on um, EF or just a new new team? Yeah, no, for sure. I think um, I, I do feel like a different rider here, and I think it's not so much because of, like, I think, the, you know, the work I put in, the, the level of, like, professionalism is still the same, but it's that different atmosphere, and, you know, the, the team have got a lot of faith in me. And I, it's nice, it's refreshing, you know, to have a whole team believe in you and, and your abilities and what you can do. And and then the flip side of that is I want to repay them, I want to show that. Um, 
So yeah, I'm just loving it, to be honest. It's weird, isn't it? Like, change is good. I was in, I was in Green Edge for six years, and, you know, you sort of get pigeonholed in this position, and you start to believe it yourself, good or bad, whatever. And you come to a new team, and all of a sudden, they've seen you only from the outside, and you come in, you go, hang on, I am that guy. I can do that. So you get this belief again. Have you sort of felt, I've seen that, the way you've been racing, you're in a different position too. The way EF rides is very different to the way Sky or Ineos rode. So now is it like feeling a bit weird sometimes when you're just sort of not sitting in that one line at the front or you just got that freedom to go in breakaways, things like that? Yeah, 100%. I think it's 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 good for it's good for me also for, it's, it's like healthy for me to have different options and, and, and not ride how I kind of spent the last couple of years riding with Sky. And yeah, like like you said, it's 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 also a thing where what, what's kind of your role at Ineos or Sky, it's kind of just expected, and it's not so much a uh, oh, good job today or well done. It, you don't feel as appreciated. Mm. Whereas here, you you I really feel like yeah, I, I bring something to the team, and they, and they value that. And um, yeah, it, and it's nice it's nice to feel appreciated and wanted. You know, it's a normal human thing, I guess. What about the kit, mate? You like being some outrageous kit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when I found out it was it was Palace at the start of the year, I thought, oh, it'd be nice to ride the tour for the for the <laughs> stash. Um, but no, I love it. I think it's whatever Rafa do, we're not, they, they normally do well. And obviously when Palace is on board as well, it's, yeah. It's, it, and for me also, it makes my first tour even more special because of that. You know, there's, there's even more kind of drama around it, I guess. Bernie, mate, other side of the fence for us, isn't it? Oh, yes. And trust me, it was better on the other one. It, probably not following Wild Fun Art today, but it was definitely more organised there. <laughs> <laughs> mate, you've actually been... Um, in the media scrum or the you know life in the um, in the press room but also you've gone back into the peloton a little bit now director sportif aren't you oh yes i'm doing kind of both so um, it's a long season for me and uh, an in- intensive season so i'm doing giro tour walter and did a giro for commentary tour here in our life for eurosport and the next thing is then i'm going to be sports director for bora in uh, walter so that's uh while well, the tour most likely have to prepare all the stages what do you think then? So you've done all three now. You've done rider, obviously, for many years, but then now you did a little bit of media stuff, and now back in the game as a sports director. What do you prefer at the moment? Oh, I still enjoy everything, really, because it is really inter- interesting. Television work and all that around how people react. It, it, I think it's amazing, but at the same time, uh, as a sports director, it's demanding. Modern cycling, you have to know everything. There is no, nothing you can leave and say, I will find out for you guys. The riders want that information in that second and you have to provide it. And at the same time, it, that's, uh, it is very demanding and I, that's why I enjoy it. It's like it's a never boring day. It's never the same day, and, uh, but it's the same for television. So I have no idea. Probably I keep doing both. Woodsy, we're standing at the front here just, before, just as you got back from a brutal finish. Stage four already. Mate, that thing kicked off, didn't it? Yeah, well, it was looking amazing. Uh, not that I saw much of him. I was at the back, but I looked up the hill when he went, and he was a long ways away. I, I knew like, I could see my future. And it was going to be suffering. What's it like now at the tour? Now we've left Denmark. Denmark was like epic, crazy, really busy, really stressful, actually, just from the crowd, from what I understood. Now we're back in France for the Tour de France. Are you feeling like a bit more comfortable now? Are you feeling like the groove a bit? Yeah, strangely no. Like the the first two days in Denmark, the first two days in Denmark were amazing, but then coming back here, it uh, it's weird. Like uh, it's almost like the race has started again, uh, just because we had that rest day. It was like it was a superfluous rest day for the riders. It was needed for the staff, but for uh, for us, it was just almost like we didn't need it because the first two days were actually the first two days were surprisingly easy, and then uh, take the rest day and it's almost like uh, it reset again. It was like getting getting started all over again. Well, was today like a first day for you? Yeah, definitely. Except the break's gone so easy the last three days as well. It's, like, it's shocking. Like, normally, you know, it's a bit of a battle for the break, but no one's really won it. Maggie's kind of got it on lockdown at the moment. And, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a really weird start to the tour. Why? Why do you reckon that? Like, why is, I was thinking, why is B&B not going for the break? Why is, you know, even you guys not throwing someone in there? Yeah, yeah I was thinking the same thing. Like, why, why aren't we putting guys in? Why... Uh, but uh, I think one Magnus has got such a stronghold on the one jersey that's up for grabs at the moment for the breakaway. Who's beating him in those sprints? Yeah, like even I actually watched him go on the last day of Denmark. And I entertained the idea of going with him. But I was like, what am I going to do there? I'm not going to beat him on a Cat 4. Like Maggie's one of the best guys in the world on a sprint like that. 
I'm not going to do anything against him. So uh, I think everyone's kind of no thinking that. And so that's why no one's really going in there. And also, I think everyone's just a bit afraid of what's to come. And for you, what's your feel now for the rest of the race? I see you've got a bit of a different tack to, to normally how you ride, maybe looking for stages. What's your idea about this year's Tour de France for the big wood man? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, just... Uh, Stay at the back for the first bit. Stay out of trouble. I've always crashed every Tour de France I've done. And it's always held me back from, I think, winning. Uh, I've come third a couple times. Uh, no, sorry, I've come third, come, had some close calls. But uh, uh, I think the injuries that I sustained from previous crashes helped me back. So this one's just stay safe this first week and then go off to the break. I'm speaking to Jean-Marc Marino, mate. It's been a few years since we've seen each other. Back in yeah. my first year as a professional, actually before I was a professional, we were racing together, and now we've, we've met each other back at the Tour de France. Tell me about your position in the Tour de France. Uh, now I'm in the Tour. I'm dealing uh, on the motorbike. I'm dealing with all the vehicle inside the race, the bubble race. So that means the TV, uh, camera TV, the uh, photographer, all the VIP cars and all the cars, the Shimano cars, the neutral cars, and even the team's cars uh, to uh, make the security for the rider and uh, also for making all the pictures, uh, the media needs for the race without making any risks for the riders. That's my job. It's an amazing job because you get to sit right there at the back of the peloton yeah. on the motorbike, you get to see all the action. It's actually got to be the job that you have to be a cyclist because you have to yeah. know how the peloton moves. You've got to know how to let the, the motorbike guys go through. Yeah. So you were telling me when we had a quick conversation that all the guys who are on these motorbikes are ex-professionals. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. You need to be ex-professional because uh, you need to anticipate what the peloton will do. Or if they will stop, or if you can see if it's windy, you know it will be uh, an acceleration from, from the teams. So you have to understand the race before it happens. And all our uh, drivers are ex-professional cyclists. Uh, my pilots, uh, all the VIP cars are ex-pro cyclists, French, uh, uh, Spanish, uh, from everywhere in the world. And, uh, and they, ra they do the race with us all year long. So they have a good experience and uh, that's why uh, uh, we are I hope the best organization and uh, and we can provide uh, the, the best race for the rider and also for in the TV and uh, for everyone. Do you sometimes, even though you're doing your job, yeah. you're right there in the race, or sometimes are you a fan? Do you sometimes watch the racing and think, ah, this is cool, I get yeah. to see the best position? Yeah, yeah. For the first time in my life, I am in a, in a mountain with the Poga car. <laughs> and, and, and Roglic, it never happens uh, when I was riding, you know, I was in a... Uh, Gruppetto with you in the climb, so <laughs> no, now it's of course your fan, yeah. and uh, you. I am more impressed now than I used to be a cyclist because you realize you you know you see the face of the guy, you see the pain, and uh, you also see everything. All the riders, the good teammates, the guy who worked very well for the team, the guy who did who cheat a little bit, you know, who doesn't work that much, and uh, most of the time some sport director who are my friend. They asked me the job of the, the, yeah. the guys, yeah, because you see everything. I'm just walking along here inside the barriers with Andrew. Andrew, where are you from? So I'm from Liverpool in the UK. And actually, I just looked down at you as we're walking along here. You don't have one of the golden lanyards on. I was like, how did you actually get in here? Uh, managed to jump over the barriers. <laughs> so everyone out there listening, that is not what you do. No. And you will get kicked out. But he's taken a risk and well done, mate. Thanks, Mitch. Well, enjoying the podcast and uh, keep up the good work. And you enjoying the tour too? What's uh, the vibe like? Yeah, it's been excellent. Um, no, really good. Um, the weather's been beautiful the last couple of days when I uh, came over from the UK. So I think today's really when the, the tour starts proper with the cobbles. So it'll be interesting to see how the, the GC favourites get on. What are you going to do today for the cobbles? Uh, so I'm going out to the cobbles, uh, jump back in the car, drive a couple of hours down the road to, to one of the sectors. Um, so hopefully no punctures for the uh, the big favourites, but um, that's all part of the part of the game. Are you going to sneak into a team car, are you? Uh, no, well, you know, if the offer is there, but uh, no, happy to watch from the road for the rest of the day. Ben O'Connor, it's obviously a big day. How are you feeling leading into it, mate? Yeah, I'm a bit nervous, but it's the same, I think, for pretty much every single other bloke here <laughs> for the race. So, 
you know, I just have to strap in and hope that there's no big problems. I know I've just seen the cobbles uh, in April and that was about the only thing. Maybe someone will put some tape on my fingers because that's more or less the, the hard thing. It's not the Roubaix length. You don't have as many cobbles, so I don't think the blister issue is uh, the main thing today. I think it's more the, you know, the chicken fingers that you have after every uh, after every sector. So I, you really just have to have the right material, the right tyres, and then go in with uh, an open mind and do your best. <laughs> Given that positioning will be crucial, are you expecting it to just be a big fight to that first sector? Yeah, the thing is, after the first sector, there's still a long way till the next one's 20k. So I think, I mean, it's probably there, 20k, so that everyone can regroup after a big crash. Because I'm sure that's what's going to happen. So I just hope that a lot of us can get through all right because uh, everyone's going to be really nervous. Everyone's going to want to be at the front, but uh, yeah, the Pave sectors aren't massive, so you're going to have some uh, rough and tumble today. Mate, have you got um, Oliver Nason looking after you today? Because you've got a really good classic sky around you. What's the plan from the team? I think the, the plan is really just to stay all together. I think if you have more or less six, eight guys, well, six, seven, five, however many are there, all together around you, it's pretty difficult to lose a lot of time because uh, it is only a short stage and it is flat. So Ooh, The famous last words. Yeah, it is the famous last words, but that's what you hope for. It's exactly what happened in 2018 and I believe it will be more or less like this, hopefully. <laughs> do, you, do you know what, to get a bit of tech, do you know what tyre pressure you're riding? Yeah, I've got 30 mil tyres with four 4.2. Awesome. So, All right, I'm looking for... as well, so that's... What we've done, that's what we tested, that's what we tried as well, and the, guy, the boys liked it for Roubaix, and I didn't mind it when we used it in April, so hopefully that's the go. <laughs> Don't get too many punctures. Awesome. I love the confidence, mate, and it works for you, so good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Woodsy, what uh, tyre what pressure are you going for, mate? I got 3.6 on the front, 3.8 in the back. Who's advised you on that? Uh, Guillaume Boivin. Top 10 at Roubaix, you know? Yeah, well, that's pretty, I was about to say, pretty good advice there. Uh, what's your tactic today? What are the, what, what are you guys going to do to stay safe or are you going to go aggressive? What's the plan? Man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to try and try everything. Uh, stay at the back. But I don't want to stay too far back because I don't want to lose too much energy. You got any tips for me? I would say you got to, you got to, yeah, be on the offensive. Go for it, you know. Don't fall to the sides of the stones. Go stay in the middle. Everyone's probably said that to you a million times. Stay in the middle. Everyone's going to fall away on the sides, and just you're going to just slowly move up as the guys fall away in front of you. I hope you're right. I hope you're right, buddy. Pray for me, my man. Don't be scared, Woodsy. You'll be right. Thanks, buddy. Have fun. More like it, Carlos Verona. <laughs> I spoke to your mechanic before, actually. Yes. He told me about your tires. You got special tires on today. Yes. How are you feeling? How's the whole team feeling? Yeah, I think today is a key stage. I think there is a lot of to lose. Not too much to gain, so let's try to survive to the stage. It will be difficult because in the covers everything can happen. And yeah, we count in the team with some guys with a lot of experience like Erbiti and another ones like me with zero experience. Today would be my first race in the covers. <laughs> I did the covers in Flanders, but yeah, I did the recon and it's nothing compared to this. So yeah, let's try to survive the, the day. How did you feel in the recon? Because I heard a friend of mine did the recon and he ran into you guys. And he said he ran into one of the other, your teammates and he said, hey, what tyre, he's a Belgian guy, he said, what tyre pressure do you have on? And one of your teammates said, ah, oh, I don't know, I've got no idea. Tyre pressure is key. Do you know what you've got in your tyres today? Yes, yes, around four bars. We actually did a last recon before coming here. We tried different pressures. So yeah, I mean, we're not being here, but now I think science is everywhere. We have a good engineer in the team, Ivan Velasco. Also, we are working close with the guys from SIP and SRAM, so yeah, we have, like, we are from old school, but we have everything under control. We just miss experience, but we know everything. You've got a Vidi, though. He is one of the best cobblestone, Spanish cobblestone riders in the, in the, in the past, forever. What about, what has he been saying to you guys? Yeah, I mean, like, not, not, at the end, people can tell you a lot of things, you know, but you have to feel it. And I think, yeah, we did two records with Enrique. We have here Imanol with him, so yeah. I think. Let's see today. Good luck. Go, Carlos. You'll be right. We will need it. Thank you so much. Hamo, been a few days since I spoke to you, mate. Now we're on the cobbles. How have things progressed since we last spoke? Uh, I mean, not too much has changed. Still, still a bit of the same old shit. A lot of, a lot of stress for you know, not so much like yesterday. It was just a bunch of crazy nervous all day, and then yeah, I think we all got our pants pulled down a bit on that last hill, eh? But. Uh, 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of hype around today, so it's kind of, yeah, it's nice to finally get here, but yeah, it'll also be nice to, get to finish it, you know. Speaking with Beardy, he's a very well-known photographer out of Tasmania, mate, a Roubaix stage. What is the plan for the photographers on a day like today? Because you could potentially go chasing and miss everything. Yeah, it's a pretty nervous day. You speak to everyone, they've all got different plans, but yeah, you're kind of crisscrossing um, across the course to find as many spots as possible. I'm going to go to sector 11, which is early in the race. Not much will happen, but we'll get some scenic shots there on the cobbles, and then we're going to cut across to number five, which is a bit more of a bananas, like four, four star sector. I think it's 2.8 k's long. Um, and then maybe go across to the last sector, which is 5 gauge from the finish, where all the fireworks will be going off. So, yeah, if I can get there and get some money shots, I'll be very, very happy. Well, today's going to be a big day. We're just following Bay, the cobble sectors, been out there getting interviews the riders are pretty nervous and today I'm, gonna, I'm pretty nervous too to try and follow this race it's going to be great we're probably going to miss the race trying to follow the race but anyway let's just see how it goes come Nuggets go Maggie I miss it I want to be out there it was uh, oh, it's good to see I really could feel the, the energy from the race. Um, didn't expect to see uh, Pogaccia off the front on with Servant grimacing in his wheel. See, I told you, he was pretty handy on the old cobble. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Bogalicious crash. He did not come through yet. He, he, was just, he was just there. He was just there. He's crashed. He had all stuff of his snicks and oh. Vinga Gar was with him. Three of them there. Are you sure Vinga, no, I think Vinga Gar was in the front. the front. Oh, it might have been Sepp. Um, Sepp and Krauschweiger. And. Ben! Tom Pitts! Um, ben O'Connor, Chris Brown. Like it hadn't got crazy, and then all of a sudden. Oh la la. Oh no, Bosenhagen's gonna get him. Bosenhagen, huh? Oh la la, you know, funny drink you packed. Valanti? Yeah, Taco, Taco van der Horen. Taco! Taco van der Horen. Kwaki. Why what is taco? Oh la la! Oh we? What a finish! Clark! What a finish! What happened to Magnus? Magnus got dropped on the run in there. You rented me? Simon Clark. Tell me now, is this complete for you, you know, coming to this sort of end part of your career, I'm not saying you're done, but do you feel like complete now? The, the tour stage, you know, the Vuelta stages, wearing the pink in the Giro, you know, what more do you need to really do to be, you know, satisfied? I mean, this is pretty close, yeah. The, this was the one big box that I hadn't ticked in my career, a childhood dream and, and, and a goal. And so, yeah, to have ticked this off uh, is pretty special and... You know, I won't give up. I'll set new goals and keep pushing because, you know, if you're not going forward, people are passing you. So, uh, you know, it doesn't finish there, but it's pretty satisfying nonetheless. What about the team? A big um, achievement for the team. What's the sort of the fallout last night? You know, how was it, what was the reception from the team? Yeah, look, the team's absolutely stoked. Um, it's their first Tour de France win in, in, in the history of their team, of, of the team as well. So a very big day for the team as well as for me. So, yeah, it's super stoked all round. And, yeah, we we'll hope we can, you know, we've got a really good vibe in this team and we've got strong riders and we've got riders going, going really well. So uh, I would be surprised if we don't 
I'm not going to say we're going to win another stage straight off the bat, but I think you'll see us contending for a few more stages as well. We've got JJ here. He's been on the pod before. Mate, was it like being at Paris Roubaix yesterday in the back of the car? I know it was shorter, but it felt like a Roubaix stage. Uh, Roubaix, didn't it? Yeah, it was, uh, it was something different. Um, I mean, it's sort of that classic feeling came back on. And, yeah, it was go time for us. I mean, it's natural instinct, more or less. Was it hectic back in the cars? Did you guys have many problems? What was it like back there in the convoy? It was super dusty. We couldn't see the car in front of us, and basically we just watched the TV. We had zero mechanicals, um, which is super good for us. Um, myself, I was really nervous in the start if something's going to happen to the leaders, to everyone, basically. But, yeah, in the end, it was a really good day for us. No no punches, no mechanical. How great is that? Yeah, but so basically we had two punches, but the guys get checked the wheels. Um, but far as from my side, I didn't get out of the car at all. So it's just driving from A to B in a normal way. So personal note here for Roubaix next year, this is the setup. Did you run 32s in the end or 30s? So 30s, uh, jubilous, and basically... This is basically the Rubay wheels we used in the beginning of the year. We just made them new completely for the stage and they're fresh. So the guys are good to go with them and it's done back in service course now. Were the boys pretty happy with the material? Super happy. Um, they were smiling, but then in the end they were tired by the end of the stage, but all of them all around were super happy. How are you feeling now as we sort of get deep into this first week? It feels like the second week already, but are you starting to feel the fatigue? I'm feeling the fatigue on this side. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm tired already. How's the, the vibe now with you and in the teams? Everyone's sort of feeling the, the, the tour fatigue, I guess? Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm tired. I can be honest with you. It's, like, it's not just the start of the tour. It's before the tour, like, all the preparation going into it. And, yeah, now we're basically starting the tour in a normal way. If I can put it that way, but yeah, it's. I mean, I think I think we're all looking forward for the first big race day, just to relax. What's your job today? Well, just in the car. First car. First car. Yeah. I'm walking along here with Tom from Swa Cycling. Tom, we're in Belgium and the tour's here. What's it like when the tour comes to Belgium? It's. It feels like it's gone up about ten notches. Yeah, I think so. It's crazy. It's uh, everyone was waiting for it, and it's uh, right now the tour is here, so it's. It's amazing, all these people coming out, it's, uh, wow. Do you like it? Do you like it coming to the Tour de France? Like, I know you love cycling, but coming down here and just seeing this, you know, even just the when Van Art's riding along, the crowd's like doing a Mexican wave. It's really cool, isn't it? It is, it is, and they recognize like uh, Peter Sagan, and, and they are completely crazy when the, when the yellow jersey arrives. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's so easy to access, and, and people love it. Well, we're walking down to the start. Let's go and see these guys roll off for a pretty cool day. Yeah, yeah, looking forward. Matt Stevens, we're here in Belgium, mate. This is going to compete with Denmark. Oh, it's brilliant. I, I love Belgium. I, mate, I, I don't know. I, I think all as, as bike riders, we all of us in different degrees feel at home here, don't we? There's so much warmth. It's so genuine. It's woven into the fabric, isn't it? Here, it really, really is. Just look at the fans, they, they love it. I couldn't believe it on the square there, here in Banche, how deep the crowds were. It's, yeah, and it's electric. They just understand it, don't they? It's just, oh look, they're about to take off. This is the binge stage, stage five? Six. Six. <laughs> and they're yeah, off. They are indeed. I think the wind could play a part today, mate. I mean, that, that final as well. I was chatting to Matt White earlier on. He says he thinks it could be a breakaway today. We'll, we'll soon find out. But I reckon another fast, attritional stage. It's been a really good tour so far. Uh, but I think yesterday it really kicked into life, didn't it? It did. Durbo, mate. I mean, asking how hard was that out there? Being confirmed by a couple guys. You're a big engine. Was it hard? <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. It was brutal. Like I think we did 100k in two hours, and then just carried on from there. I think the whole stage in the end was four and a half hours, and it's 220k. So it was just bullshit, to be honest. What's some of the data? Oh, enough. I think I've averaged 300 for the day, and so maybe 370 normal or something. <laughs> oh, I made I'm a... not very efficient, and uh, I like to look and see, take a lot of wind. 
<laughs> yeah, okay, well, that, that makes sense. Then. No, it, it looked brutal out there. Have you got any idea what Walt Van Art was doing? No idea. No idea. I think for a finish like this, it suits him down in the ground with the form he's got. But in the end, it actually suited us, suited us very well. Everyone chased uh, the GC guys with full slang. Perfect. There's no way we wanted to chase for 220k. Um, in the end, we've got some good bike handlers, so we just sort of, as Met Luca Metzik calls it, we stay in the death zone until the very last minute. And then uh, we took the risk and we got out and put Matthews in good position into that bottom of that last climb and uh, ran second, so we've got to be happy with that. Stage six of the tour, things have just been amping up, up, up after a slow start, what it seemed in Denmark. How can you see what's going to go from here? Like, we're into the, the La Planche, Super La Planche tomorrow. It's going to be hell, isn't it? Yeah, I don't... Um, I remember from last year, it, it doesn't really slow down, to be honest. Like, climbers just get faster. They climb, everyone's going, oh, today's going to be, you know, surely everyone's tired, you know, and then just goes bullshit hard. So, I wasn't surprised today it was going to be like that. Um, so, anyway, it will, just, uh, it will just keep getting harder and people will just keep saying crazy things at the end. <laughs> Meza, <laughs> what the hell was going on out there? <laughs> oh, the hell uh, break loose, or how you say? It's like the break didn't go for 70, 80 k, and then yeah, Wout van Art, obviously on the motorbike. Oh, this guy's amazing. I have never seen this before. Like the when the break goes, the yellow jersey goes in the break, and then he just rips it up. Unbelievable, but actually lucky. Also, Jakob was there, so the GC teams were a bit panicking there. Uh, they brought it back, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, this stage will make vote a little bit more tired. So uh, also the other guys have a chance. Do you have any idea why he was out the front? I'm still trying to work it out. What do you think that was all that? Was it about losing the yellow jersey so they don't have to control anymore? Uh, you can lose it uh, without spending so much energy. Uh, but yeah, he was super aggressive from the start, like uh, we saw he wants to be in that break of the day today. And there was a couple of groups going uh, out and chasing and just like didn't stop. Uh, and then in the end, just a group of three guys, uh, which was actually quite surprising. Does this confirm to you why I was really making a really good decision to retire last year because of the peloton now is going warp speed. This was ridiculous. Off the back of yesterday. Definitely. I mean, uh, I think I'm next guy to retire just because of that. Good job in the final, by the way. Like you said, you set Bling up there. I saw you right into the climb. Were you happy with your job? Yeah, I mean, uh, the first initial plan was uh, trying uh, to get over that uh, third cat climb also for myself. But when I saw there will be a small group going over and uh, we were in a really good position, there was also a crash a couple of Ks uh, be, uh, like before. So I said, oh, let's take advantage of it and uh, let's try to make this group as small as possible. Then uh, Michael can do his job in the final. And obviously he was actually going really good and uh, finishing second behind Pogacar is uh, it's a really good job. Awesome, mate. Go get in the bus. Get ready for another big one tomorrow. Well, here we go. Another day of the Tour de France. Now, we're a bit heading into the mountains today. So, I'm going to see if the boys are nervous yet. Another crowd here. Look at the crowds. It's just amazing here. Every single day I come, I know it's obvious to say, but the crowds are just huge at the starts, along the route, and of course at the finish. We're at stage seven today. Zach, we spoke when we first got to France. Now a few days have ticked away. We've had the Roubaix stage. We've had the, you know, the ridiculously fast stage yesterday. Now we're starting to get to the mountains. Tell me a little bit more about the vibe, about how things have sort of settled inside the team. You know, as, as the tour has rolled on, are the guys feeling a little bit more settled? The hype's gone down a bit, or everything's just still on, you know, going crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing with the first week of the tour is is it's always stressful, in particular when you start somewhere else. Then we had the Roubaix stage. Longy wasn't also, you know, straightforward. So, yeah, now we're settling into the game, but there's some tired boys out there, that's for sure. And your guys, you know, Woodsy, he's been potentially looking at some stages throughout today. Is today going to be one of those days? I wouldn't say we gave him a week off, but a pretty chill start to the tour. Um, and the idea was, as, as it was all along, is to, yeah, race starts here. So let's see what he's capable of today. 
What about you behind the wheel? And the, your first Tour de France behind the wheel. What does that feel like, you know? Well, I heard that you get your director's license once you've driven Paris Bay. So I think I've got, I'm have got. i on my P's now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's see one day when I drive it. But yeah, it was all good so far. I didn't, didn't have any big stress situations. Uh, but definitely need to be sharp. What was it like driving the cobbles? Because I drove one sector, sector one, and our car hit the bottom straight away. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know how to drive these things. We, could you hear things in the car getting smashed around? Yeah, like, <laughs> I definitely wouldn't have wanted that to be my first race. Um, but it's all just about, yeah, how you control the, where the car actually is. The, the cobbles is different more because you can't see that much. So the guy, you've got to trust the guy in front of you following, you know, but you've really got to be even more on your rear view mirrors to watch for groups coming back through you know we had the o- o'connor group obviously coming back through the convoy and then back out the back of the convoy between the sections so it's a lot going on you got to focus <laughs> can you explain to someone out there if anything you can relate to anyone like even me what can you relate it to is it like riding a bike is it like racing go-karts what is one thing you can relate to driving in the convoy yeah probably like driving in china <laughs> no one waits you know so you got to really you drive defensively i would say but you need to like you can't back down you know so if you see a gap you have to go for it and it there is a level of respect here i think with the tour everyone understands that there's a lot more at stake because there's so many people on the road so you see like when i was driving at lower level races there's a lot more risk to take and guys don't really know what they're doing the guys here i would say are le- less aggressive so if you hear on the radio a lot of guys respect you you have a lot more motorbikes too so the motorbikes i don't know if you've seen they they stick on the left right so when you're moving up as soon as you hear a car coming through, the car brakes in front, so then you can go into the right lane and then out of the left. So you're kind of just snaking the convoy the whole time and, and people are really respectful. So I would say the convoy here, although everyone's trying to get the same spot, same as the race, there is a level of respect here um, and, and you've got to drive to that. Otherwise, you'll just get blocked straight away. Like if you flick someone, then you're going to get flicked five minutes later anyway. All right, mate. Big stage ahead. I'll let you go. Thanks a lot. Rod Ellingworth, big name in the uh, Ineos Brigade. Mate, we're here at the Tour de France. Tell me about it. You've done a lot of Tour de France's, you know, with the team. What is this big beast? You know, how do you get your head around it? How do you get the riders in the right place and and your role when you come to these big races? Well, I think, you know, obviously we've got a lot of experience now at this over over the years. So, um, you know, I think the journey into the tour starts quite early on in, you know, maybe the back end of the year before, really. So, you know, certainly with this group here, we, we all first met properly about the tour in December yeah. you know so Steve Cummins who was leading the tour we knew he was going to be the lead DS so it's about him going on that journey with the lads from that point on you know you get all the, the course details don't you, you know and you work back from the demands of the event so um, you know you, we, we had the whole group maybe 15 riders who were potential tour riders all sat together went through every day looked at all the challenges so that so straight away they're into it you know the the straight away you start looking at the detail and what it's going to actually take so that's you know that that's what we do and my my role really is just to back all that up and actually not tread on anybody's toes and get in the way but just to support them with all the experience that we have uh and steer them in the right direction really but i've got to say steve's done a great job with brett and and um you know they they really have gone on the journey and that sort of key moments in the season then obviously races but also training camps there's them little phone calls they've had groups you know they've got their whatsapp groups and and chatting together and you know it's all that sort of it's yeah it's just going on that journey isn't it you know building them up what about on the day-to-day process for you when you're here at the race what what, what is your role um on the day-to-day well i can't tell you that i'm I mean, <laughs> feet up on the back what's telling no i mean obviously there's the team in the background still to stay on top of you know we've got a training camp on in Andorra at the moment we've got the rest of the season coming up we've got a lot of recruitment going off and 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 everything else so you know there's the business behind here on on the race really my role during the day is I think you know I like to watch the telly I like to see what's happening Mm. and then you know we meet every evening as a performance team and I can offer my opinion to to the group We, we believe in collective opinion we believe in everybody put in their thoughts that you're not here to as a you know to just on holiday you're here to offer your opinion and that's it that's everybody that's a nutritionist that's the physio that's everybody can offer their opinion and then we collectively look at that and then um you know it's up to myself really with steve to make the decisions on what we're doing nads pedersen we had a great time in denmark tell me a little bit what it's like riding the tour de france but also what it's like riding the tour de france in your own country 
So in, in Denmark, it was way more. It was way more than we expected. All the Danish riders. It was. It was. The crowds was amazing, and and so so much more people on the roads than, than we expected. You know, the last days you saw on social media that people was pissed that we had to close down Copenhagen and stuff like this. So uh, we kind of expected a little bit of a shit time also, but the crowd was absolutely amazing. And also, if you ask. Other other riders in the peloton who isn't Danish, they they would say the same. Mm. So definitely, that was that was crazy, especially for a Danish guy uh, to to feel the support and and to feel how how big a party it was on the roads. It was uh, really special, also because everyone knew that it was once in a lifetime maybe that the tour is coming to Denmark. So and and coming to France, of course, it's it's not the same. They have it every year, but. It's still a lot of people here on the roads, so it's, it's, it's for me it's it's definitely not the same, but it's still a nice feeling to to feel the support from all the people and and feel that they are enjoying cycling as well. What about the Roubaix stage? Was it cool riding through that? The crowds, the dust, or were you just like, oh, you know what? This is actually just pretty damn hard. Well, of course, it's always hard. Roubaix and cobblestones, it's always yeah. super hard, but. Look, again, the crowds is amazing, and they know it's a it's a really special stage. So a lot of people is going there to watch it. Uh, and yeah, on the cobbles, you know, you you saw the pictures and, and the videos of dust everywhere. You couldn't see shit if you were just 20 spots behind. And it's just a spectacular race. So in 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 all, you know, in general with spectators, with the race in general, with the course, equipment, everything is just special that day. It's a weird thing, as the peloton approaches, you get a bit nervous, weirdly. Well, I do anyway. Oh, here's a drop rider, a VT. Watching the side of the road, I'm at the bottom of La Planche del Belfi, and I'm getting anxious as the riders come towards us. Don't know why that is, but it's exciting. Richard Spink, mate. Regular on the podcast these days, Spinky, you're working with Bike Exchange. You're a glorified physio. How's it been working on the tour with the boys? Well, it's been superb. Uh, the, the lads have come here with, with good objectives. Um, the, the team spirit has been amazing from day one. And that's just been heightened with the win we got, stage three, and then with a good second place yesterday. Derby obviously had a fine ride today up the road. But, the, but all week long, the, the, the atmosphere has been brilliant. The lads have all pulled together. Uh, we just got a great group here, and we're just really enjoying ourselves. Is this your first tour? It's. I've done did a bits and pieces last year, but this is the, the first good run of it. Yeah. How does it feel? Like you know, now you're on the road for three weeks, and you can feel the ebbs and flows of the team, but also the outside environment, the pressures, all that. The Tour de France overall. How are you feeling about it all? Oh, it's just an incredible atmosphere. I mean, when you think of the tour worldwide, it's what is it third? in the viewing figures in the world behind the World Cup and uh, the Olympics. I mean, it's, it's the, the, the big, one of the biggest sporting events in the world. And you can just capture that with the, with the people on the road. I mean, what a start in Denmark. Never seen crowds like Well, I saw crowds like that in Yorkshire, but I think they were even more partisan here. So, yeah, it's just the atmosphere pushes you along. Um, obviously, everyone's tired, but you, uh, yeah, you, your adrenaline uh, keep, keeps you going. Looks like team cars here, so back to work. Thanks, mate. Michael Bling Matthews, mate, we've well and truly kicked this Tour de France off. A few really tough days again today was a really fast start. And into the Super Plunge del Belfi, a very famous climb with the gravel. Tell me about your day and your Tour de France up until now. Um, yeah, my day was pretty simple, really. Uh, it was after yesterday's effort, I was uh, on my hands and knees. So I just uh, sat in the pillow. The guys were jumping around to try and get in the break. Um, Derbe got in, which was great. He uh, had a crack until the final climb. And I haven't actually spoken to him yet, but um, I heard he was going well out there, so that was really nice. And um, yeah, up until now, until yesterday, actually, it was pretty quiet for me. Um, we had a couple of sprint days with Dylan, um, a TT. And uh, yeah, it was my turn to have a crack yesterday. I came up second best to Superman, but um, mm. yeah, I mean, gave it a crack. Uh, he's looking pretty ridiculous at the moment. Two ridiculous guys in this race. Even he took that victory out today. I know you probably haven't seen it because you've only literally just rolled in, but it was incredible. Wait till you see it when you get a chance. So no uh, no shame in getting sort of 
put away by the Superman yesterday. But how are you finding a bit of a different role as well? Because you've been helping um, Dylan in the in the leadouts, um, something that you know you're not known for, but you're sort of transitioning into that with a big sprinter behind you. How's that been for you? Yeah, I mean, when you got the fastest guy, in, one of the fastest guys in the world in the team, um, that uh, it was actually something we were looking forward to this year. Was was getting a, a real fast sprinter last year. We were starting to struggle a little bit with me trying to do every single stage basically trying to go into breakaways trying to do this flat sprints intermediate stages and go- going in breaks on the mountain day so um yeah the key was to have a really fast guy here in the in the tour this year and that could help out in the in the lead outs i can do a really good job in that i think i have a lot of experience in doing sprints myself and i know what a sprinter wants so um when when me and luca get together and uh, deliver dylan as best we can i think we can do a great lead up awesome mate i'll let you get in the bus What did you think? Did you get a little bit of a taste for it? Did you get that feeling? Did you get that vibe, that buzz? I hope you did. I've really had a great time over the Tour de France. I loved working with Lionel and I love working with Francois, of course, over at the Cycling Podcast. So check those episodes out if you haven't heard them already or just jump on the train now because those episodes are still rolling every day of the Tour de France. Of course, a big thanks goes out to Lara behind the scenes who's helping me do this as well helping putting together these episodes, but also the merchandise, the t-shirts, all that extra stuff you see, she's the brains behind that too. Will Jones, who puts these episodes together, and this one particularly, because it was a bit of a piece to put together. But of course, Rafa, who are supporting not only me, but also the podcast this year, and they're doing a great job making these episodes come to you guys. If you haven't checked it out yet, I'm going to remind you, go and check out swasscycling.com because that is our limited edition Tour de France t-shirt. That's going to be up for another week and a bit until the Tour de France is finished. So make sure you get across and get yourself one of those. Guys, and until next week, I've got a special talking look for you. Until then, cheers. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.